I think we all love weddings to a greater or lesser degree, but more, most of us enjoy going to weddings and uh, seeing all that goes on there. And obviously, uh, this year is exceptional where there are very few weddings happening. Uh, so maybe we're looking forward to going to a few wedding bashes later next year, hopefully, to the help of God. Uh, but what, what's very interesting about weddings, if you notice, uh, is that when the whole family comes together, there's always the, the odd uncle, you know, that one who just doesn't know how to kind of not dance very exuberantly on the dance floor and kind of embarrasses the whole family, you know, because he's doing all these moves from the 80s that just look so cheesy now. And, oh, yeah, that's, that's Uncle Phil. Yeah, he's living in France, <laughs> you know, and uh, comes back with all of his exotic ideas. And there's, you know, there's always, the family gets together and you see kind of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, 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 the strengths and weaknesses of the family, or the, the, maybe you see the, the part of the family that you're not even talking to, all right? That happens as well, where there's, you know, my sister or sister-in-law or whatever, and there was a falling out over a, a will, so they're sitting at, you know, the, the, the wedding planners were very careful to make sure they're sitting at two different tables, you know, to not... Uh, draw uh, World War Three on themselves, and so weddings are kind of a, they're kind of an interesting cross section of a family as well, because what comes together is is kind of you know everything, as I say, just the kind of the mess of a family, or maybe there even may be conversation at a certain table of a certain family member who isn't there, because they wouldn't be caught dead at a wedding for Michelle and Jimmy, because uh, of whatever happened, you know. So weddings can be kind of very interesting that way, and this reminds me of of the church, right? When the church comes together, you see, the church is, it, it, it's, full of, it's full of human beings, it's full of people, right? And so within the, even within the church, you have, you have those who just excel in sanctity and are just amazing, amazingly wonderful examples of what our faith can do for you. You know, when we let this, the light of God's love in and we allow it to transform us, like, you see that, you see that in some people, just fantastic then. Of course, there, there, are, there are hidden saints in the church too, those who are bed bound or house bound and don't get to, if you will, let that light shine uh, exteriorly and yet like, are often carrying the church with their prayers. And then in the church as well, you've got those who, who fall short of the mark. You know, you've got those who, who don't live according to what we're called to, you know, who don't obey the Lord's commands. And it's very interesting. During the week, I was having a conversation with, um, with someone about uh, difficult questions that they often come across during street evangelization. And one that came up was the, the scandals, the abuse scandals in the church. And she asked, what would I say? And if I'm honest, my answer wasn't as clear as it should be. So this is my second shot at it. Because uh, I, th I, th I, th I thought at the end, you need, in, in your head, you need to have like a clearer way of talking about this issue uh, where you balance, and you absolutely have to balance, compassion, right, for anyone who has suffered in any way with the reality of what the church is. So if you go kind of too far either direction, um, you just say, oh, yeah, they're all terrible, they're all bad. Uh, that's not helpful. Uh, whereas if you only focus on, well, you know, the, church is, is, uh, the church's teachings are perfect without giving any consideration to what has happened to people, uh, makes you look fairly cold. So we have, to balance, we have to balance these two. So just by way of uh, uh, missionary training, if you want to call it that, when people say, you still go to Mass, and the church is full of all them scandals and pedophiles and so on and so forth, so how can you justify going to Mass? What do you say? I think step one is absolutely always agree with the fact that Abuse in any way, shape, or form is abhorrent. You agree with the fact that anybody getting abused is absolutely terrible, that that's an awful crime. Something I personally often add is the fact that I have nieces and nephews, and if anything were to happen to them, I would be absolutely devastated, you know? So you're showing the fact that I care. I care, I don't want to see, if only one person got abused in the church, that's one person too many, okay? One person too many. There obviously are more. What you don't want to do is go down the route of saying, well, you know, there are people making up all these cases and all that to sue the church to make money. Don't say that. Because, especially in Ireland anyway, the majority of, of the cases are true. So don't, don't go, if you start saying that, 
you make it sound like all, all these victims are just in it for the money, which isn't the case. Abuse in any way, shape or form is abhorrent. Qualify that one first, get that one established, right? I, no one should ever be in any way, shape or form harmed, especially by members of the church. Okay, so on that we actually agree. So now the person who might be kind of aggressive towards you because you're still faithful, you actually have some common ground here. Now, generally speaking, what people will say is then, you know, it's all over the place in the church or everyone's involved in it. Now, that's where we can disagree, okay? Not ev it's obvious that not everyone is involved, for God's sake. I mean, uh, the church is the safest place in the world for children now. Uh, we're, we're watched by live stream and CCTV cameras. We have to sign in and out and up and down, and everyone has to be trained 15 million times, and I've been vetted, I don't know, maybe 20 times by now, like, safest place in the world for children right now is the church so but it's good to kind of keep in mind that idea of the family right in every family because it's composed of human beings you have really wonderful people and then you may have the alcoholic uncle you have you know really wonderful sons and daughters and then maybe you have the one who went off the rails once he hit college and then ended up in prison for drug dealing now, because of that, do you divorce yourself from your family? Do you say, well, I'm having nothing to do with my family anymore because my brother or brother-in-law ended up in prison? Well, well, no, your family is your family, and it, there are imperfect people in your family because they're human. And we have imperfect people in our church too because they're human. If you think of a doctor, uh, a doctor has a lot of patients. So if, you, if a doctor advises one of his patients, you have to stop smoking, okay? Your, your lungs are in a bad way. If you continue smoking, chances are you're going to develop lung cancer fairly lively and more than likely die of it, okay? So stop smoking. And the patient comes home and says, yeah, well, sure, look, what does that doctor know? A couple of fags here and there, what difference does it make? I mean, I've been smoking since I was four, so, I mean, you know. So, and continue smoking. Now then that's, that patient then develops lung cancer and dies. Would anyone say your doctor was useless? He went to Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly did not infirm. Do you know, do you judge a person who doesn't follow the advice of his doctor? Do you judge the doctor then as being a bad doctor? Well, no, the fellow didn't follow the doctor's advice. If anyone in the church harms anyone, they have obeyed, disobeyed civil law, they have also disobeyed what we call canon law, which is the law of the church, and they have also disobeyed God's law. Right, so there ain't no escape. Like, even if they get off civilly, right, God's law is still there, and you still have to answer before God for all that you have done or not done while here on earth. So there is justice out there. There absolutely is. But we don't judge the church by those who have fallen short of the mark, no more than I judge Ireland by how many people are in, are in Mount Joy, which is a prison for those who aren't Irish. Right? So I, I don't go around, I can count, count how many prisoners Ireland has, and the more prisoners it has, the worse of a country it is. No, they're the people who have fallen short of the mark. Maybe we should judge a country by, by those who, who've excelled in generosity and goodness and, and welcome and beauty and all this kind of thing. You know, so, so we don't judge a church by, just by those who have fallen, the few who have fallen short of the mark. So we agree that, that abuse is abhorrent, but we disagree that this is widespread in the church. Church is the safest place in the world for children right now. And I'm not saying that with any word of an exaggeration. It really is. We are watched like hawks. So... And then, last point then, is to look at the church as, as, as what it is and what it's supposed to be. We've been given a mission by God. God shares his mission with us, this great co-mission that he has given us to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. All right, this is what we're supposed to do. Now, because we've been given this mission by God, we're sharing Jesus' own mission, we're going to be attacked because this mission is entrusted to us. And so we're going to be, be attacked in a particular way. If we start dropping our guard, if we stop praying, we're wide open for attack, wide open to, for, for people within the church to try and destroy the church from within, which is, which is happening at the moment. So if people have any kind of you know, understanding of what the church is, that our, our goal, right, our goal in the church is to live as a family, as the family of God, and that there are wonderful people doing so, 
There are wonderful people setting up schools and orphanages and charities in Africa and helping people all over the place. The university system, the free school, the free education that we have here in Ireland, all these things are set up out of the goodness of people's hearts because they're inspired with love for God. So I think it's just, it's just really important that when we're speaking about these things that, uh, that we have this... this a compassionate approach to anyone who has suffered, but yet an understanding of what the church is called to, of her great mission. Just one last point. Today's gospel is very countercultural, uh, which is good because our culture is going down the swanee. So if it's countercultural, it's probably right. Um, so Jesus says, all right, this is again the word straight out of Jesus' mouth. Yeah, he's speaking about a king who has a, a wedding for his son, he's arranging a, a wedding for his son. And he invites people to come. Now, what do the people have to do? Do they have to pay? They don't. Do they have to uh, turn up with, with loads of gifts? Or do they have to do anything extraordinary? They don't. All they have to do, really, is just turn up. Right? They've been given an invitation. All you have to do is just turn up. And the guests, those who are invited, say, nah, I'd rather be on the farm, I'd rather be take care of my business, I'd rather be whatever it is, doing something else. See, in today's world, uh, salvation is presumed. So all you have to do to get to heaven is die, right? And as soon as you die, you go up to heaven, which is, the bar couldn't be any lower, really. I mean, because I can't even help dying. It's kind of going to come anyway. So it's like, <laughs> there, you, there really is no lower bar. Like, it's just, it's, it's chronic. And it's also not true. <laughs> that in order to get to heaven, all you have to do is die. No, we actually have to accept an invitation. All right, it's in the Gospels. So we've been given an invitation. So how do I accept an invitation? It's, we have to do so little in comparison to what we get. I mean, imagine, like, what's the, the longest thing you've ever had to do? When you were, remember being 10 years of age, and you had to, like, from, like, the 18th of December till the 25th, it felt like about four years. Do you know, you were kind of sitting on the couch going, it's going to be Christmas in six days! <laughs> and it was like, and it was like, you're like It's like, it's, like, it's like the longest six days ever, you know what I mean? So, anyway, so when you're young. And then when, when you're old, like you're waiting for your leaving cert results, or, you know, all these, like, these things where time just seems to slow down. Uh, but you also imagine like 10, 20 years. You imagine 100 years. That's only the beginning of eternity. Right? Like 1,000 years is only the beginning of eternity. So what we get in heaven for all eternity is just astoundingly, infinitely more than we could ever imagine or pay for, regardless of what our, our sufferings or difficulties here are. What we get afterwards is, is, is incredible. So just imagine, like, I'm so focused on my career because I want an Aston Martin DB9, an, an Aston Martin, it's a car. All right, I want a car. So I want this really expensive car, and I'm working really hard for that, and that's what I want. And I just, just compare this for a second now with all eternity. What are you doing? <laughs> like... Is that it? You know, like, I remember when I was down in Naples um, working there, and what was really fashionable was, I don't think, I'm not sure if they even exist here, but they were Hogan. They're kind of halfway between runners and shoes. They're, anyway, but like, oh, they're like the cool thing. They were like 200 euro. And imagine, like, you know, you're, you're doing overtime and extra time and a whole lot just to try and pay for your Hogan shoes. Now, obviously to us now who don't know what Hogan is, that looks completely ridiculous, although we might do the very same thing for Adidas or... Yves Saint Laurent, or whatever you do. Okay. Um, uh, but, like, you, just, you see just how ridiculous it looks. Hogan Schmogan, like. Right? But then, kind of amplify the picture slightly, you know? Where all of your life is focused on your business, your farm, your career. So bloody what? No matter how successful you are, so What? Like, you're going to leave it all. You're going to end up in a hole, being eaten by rats, r r my, mm, worms, just like everyone else anyway, right? You have to leave it all anyway. In comparison to eternity, I don't care how successful, Bill Gates, I don't care how successful he is. In comparison to eternity, it's nothing. It's just nothing. You have to leave it all anyway. So he's been given this, like, just like all of us, we've been given this invitation to heaven. So what do I have to do? All I have to do is simply accept it. Which means what? Now, there are some consequences to accepting it. It's not just, you know, getting your Willy Wonka ticket. 
and, and away you go. You do actually have to, but, but what, what the Lord is saying here is that what we have to do is so small in comparison to what we get, you know? So even if I do have to renounce going out on a Saturday night because I know all my friends are going to get hammered and if I go out with them, I'm going to end up drinking as well. So even if I do have to spend a couple of Saturday nights maybe alone, in comparison to eternity, that's actually nothing. It really is nothing. If I have to kind of learn self-control and not, you know, sleep around and follow the, 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 the culture of the moment uh, and actually, as I say, you know, have a bit of dominion over my own desires, in comparison to eternity, that's nothing. Really, it's nothing. If I have to control how much I, I, I drink, if I have to control how I use the internet, if I have to, you know, dedicate a little time to prayer every day, in comparison to eternity, it's actually nothing. You know what I mean? It's, only, it's, like, it's, it's really insignificant and yet absolutely crucial. You know, in comparison to eternity, what we are asked to do is so, so little. And yet, so many of us will say, yeah, half an hour, 45 minutes on a Sunday. It's hard. It's hard, you know? To go to actually get into the car and drive and s sit there at Mass. to walk the whole way up the aisle and get Holy Communion, you know? It's... It's hard, you know? It's difficult. You wuss. <laughs> like, would you just man up and go to Mass? Like, you know, in comparison to what you get, like, we receive Jesus. We should be willing to crawl to get here. You know, like, again, just to kind of keep in mind the big picture, because we get so focused, on, and obviously we do have to focus on what's in front of us and what's on our table and get these e emails answered and get these letters answered. And, and get this tax paid and get whatever it is. You know, there are obviously practical things that we have to do, yes, but we do them out of love because in, com in comparison to all of eternity, they are entirely insignificant. And that's it, because like, that's all that matters. All that matters is heaven. We've been given uh, an invitation. Last point, I know this is probably long. Uh, last point is that the consequences to not accepting God's invitation are actually quite serious. And it's not so much that I think God sends out his, his uh, angels to punish us. But if I don't want God's invitation, okay, I don't have to have it. But if I don't want his invitation, there's only one other alternative, which isn't good. You know, if I, if I choose, I, I, I don't want God. I want the pleasures of this world. I want the success of this world. I want to be surrounded by things uh, that are, you know, expensive and beautiful and, you know, I want to be successful and I want to be able to follow my passions and my instincts. Okay, if you do so, though, there are actually fairly long-term consequences to that. If I don't want God's invitation, I don't have to have it. But the consequences are serious and are eternal. It's what our gospel is telling us. So, like, this is, this is really serious. This is really, really serious. The Lord has prepared a banquet for us. And he has extended to each one of us an invitation. All he asks of you and I is that we accept it. That we accept his love. That we accept his mercy. That we live lives that are oriented towards heaven. So that God willing, one day at the end of our lives, as we stand before him, we will say, Jesus, I trust in you. Amen.